Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning. God bless you. Wherever you are, we extend a great blessing to you. This is Pentecost Sunday. Now, nothing is different about the Sunday, but what makes it different is that this is a day where we celebrate what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us when he sent a blessed Holy Spirit, the fire of God to live within us. And when we forget what Christ has done, when we forget who Holy Spirit is, then we do not know where we are going. But today we celebrate the Christ of Pentecost and we celebrate the spirit of Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday. The Bible says when Jesus came, he came in the spirit and in power with fire. I pray that today you will arise in your souls and ask God, put fire in my spirit, fire in my heart, fire in my mind. Let everything within me give the Lord praise. We praise his holy name for our God is a great and awesome God. Would you begin to praise the Lord with us this morning? Hallelujah to the Lamb of glory. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your goodness, for the fire that you sent us. We praise you, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you worship with us on this Pentecost Sunday? Praise the Lord. Yeah. 
comforted by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray, oh God, for the young generation, the children, oh God, who are so discouraged. Holy Spirit, would you come and enter their souls, baptize them afresh, that they would know that God is real. I pray for the youth, oh God. They're looking for many ways for them to feel peace and joy and hope. But Holy Spirit, you will dwell within them if they would welcome you to rule and to reign. Oh God, we declare over every young person, the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. The Holy Spirit is your baptizer. He will guide you. He will comfort you. He will hear your cry. He will pray and intercede for you. We pray, oh God, for every generation that are allowing the devil's devices to strike them down. But we cause them today to lift up their heads for Holy Spirit was with us. Shekinah glory come down. Oh God, on this Pentecost Sunday, may we not, oh God, in any way despair or become despondent or destroyed, but we stand in the authority of the Spirit. We are spirit being. We are human being, but we are spirit being. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We love you. We declare there's nobody like you. We stand in the authority of the Spirit and we push back the spirit of darkness in Jesus' name. Darkness flee, depression flee, discouragement flee, flee in Jesus' name. And we, oh God, we raise our hands and our hearts and our minds to the heavens and we declare, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Oh, glory be to God. Worship team, thank you so much for taking us into the throne room today. And I trust at home, you felt the throne room of God right where you are. For his spirit is right there with you. Isn't that the awesome thing about our God? You don't have to bring him and put him on a mantle. You don't have to wonder where he is. He's right there with you. Blessed Holy Ghost. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you this morning. I welcome you to our service, our online service, those in the chat. You have five chats that you can use up and say hello to others online. Those of you that are streaming from other places, we usually ask if you want to just tell us where you're from. We know we've got people from all over the world tuning in. We bless you. We welcome you. Consider yourself a child of God that Christ himself has given birth to and because you are a child of God you can now submit your life to him if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior it's so easy you can do it at any time but we want you to know we are your online church and we're here to bless you wherever you are in Jesus name amen and amen well at this time I'm just gonna ask Uh, you to just give us uh, a a bit of attention for our announcements. First of all, we thank you for your faithful giving. Many of you have found that the online access is so easy, so simple. E-transfer, push pay, uh, uh, pardon me, not push pay, e-transfer, and many different means. It's all there on the screen, online giving, text, that's what it is, and text to give. And we just encourage you to continue to give and pray over your offering as you send it. Pray and ask God to continue to bless you as you give unto the Lord. His blessing be returned to you. Father, I pray for every person, oh God, who's giving to the work of the Lord wherever they are and whatever work they give unto. Would you bless them in kind? Would you bless them full measure? Would you bless them in every turn they take and advance them? Those that are seeking jobs, God, would you provide jobs. Those that are watching the money dwindle and dry out. Father God, would you create a miracle before them that they would see the increase come from the throne room of God. You're a great provider and your supply is limitless. So we pray a blessing. We pray, oh God, for you to restore what they have lost and God cause them, oh God, to see a miracle in this day. In Jesus name. Amen. 
At this time, would you turn your attention to our PPC News, and we just thank you for giving your attention for just a moment. Pickering Pentecostal Church. It's me, it's Caleb, and I am here to bring you this week's morning announcement. This past Tuesday was our first drive-in prayer service of 2021. It was so awesome seeing many of you there, and while we're gonna continue having services all throughout the summer, we will not be having one this Tuesday, May 25th, for the long weekend. But we hope to see you when prayer resumes on Tuesday, June 1st, from 7 to 8 p.m. We're so happy to have you tuning in this morning live stream and next Sunday, Sunday, May 30th, will also be online only. So we hope to see you then at 10 a.m. Growth 102 with Reverend Vincius Brown has been amazing so far. We've really been enjoying this course as we study the book of Hebrews. And we encourage you, if you haven't been there yet, to come out on Wednesday nights. It's from 7.30 to 8.15, and it's truly wonderful. So we hope to see you there. The Big Give is a yearly event at PPC where we serve our community, but this year it'll be looking a little bit different due to the stay-at-home order. On Saturday, June 5th from 1 to 4 p.m., we will be collecting non-perishable food items for our local food banks here. If you want to contribute to this year's Big Give, all you'll have to do is pack up non-perishable food items and put them in the trunk of your car and then drive on up to PPC and our volunteers will be there to help collect what you wish to donate. It's going to be a great afternoon and we are looking forward to serving our community in this way with your support. That's all from me this morning, PPC. I'm Caleb and this has been What You Need to Know. I need to add to that today is we have the opportunity to host a pop-up vaccination clinic here at PPC. Now hear the words, it's an opportunity. In order to fulfill that opportunity, we need to quantify the need for us to do that for the region of Durham. So we have a quick survey, it's a one minute survey. Would you take that moment, go online on our website and fill it out. If you've had your vaccine, fill it out. If you've not had your vaccine, fill it out. Anyone 18 and over, and this way we can uh, prove that the need is there to do it right here in our, our, our premises. So I beg of you, if you have email from PPC, if you're on our email, blast we've sent you a link if you're not on our e-blast you can go online it's for friends it's for family it's for anyone in the region so would you go online and do that one minute survey and so that we can make this opportunity a reality and so we thank God for the way he's blessing our church and would you show yourself uh, faithful in helping us through this process Praise the Lord. At this time, the worship team is going to come back with a song. And right after they have just ministered to our souls again, we're going to be blessed with none other than one of our favorite preachers, Reverend Chuck Price. Reverend Chuck Price is a worldwide evangelist, an international evangelist with reapers in the rain. And he always comes with a word. He's always welcomed in this pulpit. He's always beloved when he brings the word because his word comes with fire from his soul and an integrity in his ministry that is transcended right across time and space. And so today, would you prepare for a powerful word on Pentecost Sunday from our our own Reverend Chuck Price, evangelist with reapers in the rain. God bless you, worship team. Would you take us to the throne room one more time?
birthday, church. Happy birthday. This is a great day to celebrate. We thank God that Jesus Christ came and laid down his life. We thank God that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He died for our sins, rose from the dead. We thank God the Holy Spirit came. Jesus Christ thought it was a good idea. So you can trust him, he says. I'm going away, but I'm going to send one just like me. You can trust him, a comforter, a friend. If he didn't have trust in the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't have sent him, but he did. And I say, thank God, thank God. I want to take the word this morning and just apply it to where we're living. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to talk to you about the promise, the power, the presence, and the person of the Holy Spirit. If there was ever a day, and there has been, but we need Holy Spirit, to be quite honest with you now that I really don't think there's a committee, there is a prime minister, a president in the world that can get us out of where we are today. We have to have a revival. We have to have a move of God. That's it. That's our only hope. Believe me, I've walked on this planet enough years. I've been around and I'm well-traveled, but I thank God for spirit baptism, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I say thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. This is the day, church, we can open our hearts together and see what Holy Spirit has for us. So I want to speak to you today about the uh, church's birthday. You know, birth is a promise and prayer and passion and uh, in a prayer meeting, this person of the Holy Spirit. In Pentecostal circles in the POHC and others, there's, you know, there's over 740 registered Pentecostal movements in the world. Can I say that again? Over 740 Pentecostal movements. Those are registered. 740. We're just one small group of folks loving Jesus and, uh, and bringing the message of Holy Spirit. And I say thank God. And I want to bring it to your attention this morning. To speak, about, uh, the speak about tongues that don't need an interpretation. And as I travel, I find people that are confused on, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you about Holy Spirit today that doesn't need interpretation. Uh, there are those, the gifts that Paul talks about, you know, the tongues of interpretation and prophecy, and uh, then someone will interpret, someone speak in tongues. I get all that prophecy. I thank God for that. But most of us will never do that. But most Christians, most Pentecostal believers have this beautiful infilling, this baptism, this spirit baptism that they speak in tongues every day of their life. Uh, in their prayer closet, they're Matthew 6, 6. So you may never stand in a sanctuary and declare. You may never stand and speak in tongues or give an interpretation, but every day you can flow in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That we're baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was five years old. I could barely tie up my shoes, but Holy Spirit just came down at a good old-fashioned camp meeting, and Holy Spirit did a great work in my life. I'll tell you, it, it, uh, something I couldn't get away from changed my life, changed my life, and I say thank God. So this initial, this gateway of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14, and Luke introduces us to some of the people that became the early church. Now, Jesus had told them, listen, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send another comforter. We understand that. And he says, I want you to go and wait. I want you to go and wait. I want you to spend some time together and wait and do not leave Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, this promise of the Father. So I got it on, on, on good note today that we're promised by the Father. We're also promised by Jesus. As it was a message that was preached. And so let me just read to you this partial guest list that's in this upper room. So they went, verse 13, verse chapter 1, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room they, where they were staying. There were present was Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Edwards, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, son, uh, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, in prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And let me just stop there. We'll come back to the word of God and read some more. But I want you to see this partial guest list. Listen, they're just ordinary people that served an extraordinary God, just natural people that served a supernatural God. And I say, thank God. So you got Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, you got Mary, no superstars, just saved souls. And yes, ladies, there was women in the upper room. There was a, and I always tell our ladies, listen, if God didn't want to use you, if he didn't want you to be a part of an end time anointing, you wouldn't have been represented in the upper room. Let me just pause right there. I get so tired of 1960s and 50s theology. Your theology ought to move along to an end time anointing. 
to bring an end time harvest. It's not something that's written in stone. We're moving somewhere. Holy Spirit is taking us where one day we're going to see Jesus Christ face to face. Come on. That ought to put a smile on your face. Some of you need to get happy today. You need to get so happy that your tongue slaps your brain. Hallelujah. And just rejoice in the good things of God in these days that we have. Never mind COVID. we got something greater, bigger, powerful coming our way. God is preparing us. This is the first time in our lives where the world is in the same situation. The whole world's in the same situation. And I'm just thinking that's the negative end. The positive end is that the whole world can experience a touch of God through the power of the Holy Spirit these last days. I believe we need to prepare now for what God wants to do in the future and will do. So we know a little bit about uh, these men and women in the upper room through the Gospels, their struggles, their failures, their insecurities. Again, natural people that served a supernatural God. It, it's, it's in the natural, it amazes me that Acts 2 by 4 even took place. It amazes me. It amazes me. I mean, left to ourselves, considering the guest list and everything surrounding that day. Let me just break it down for you. I can give you four quick thoughts in one sentence. Just four, there are four preaching points in one little sentence. 120 people in one room for 10 days waiting. This is me pausing for effect. Uh, let me say it again. Four points. It's a four-point message in this one line. And he just, I'll just put it out there. So 120 people in one room for 240 hours waiting. Waiting. And so, you know, let's quickly break that down for just a moment. It, it would have been easy for someone to say something that was hurtful. You know, Mary, Mama Mary could have looked around the room and said, Hey, where were you guys when my son needed you? Like, where were you? You bailed. You ran away. You ran away like a bunch of little children. And, and Peter, what are you doing here, man? You, you denied my son. And yeah, Mr. John, the beloved guy, and, and Andrew, the personal worker guy, and Matthew, the tax guy. Like, where were you guys when my son was bleeding out on the cross? Where were you? So mama could have risen up and said a few things to tan the boy's hide. She could have, but she chose not to do that. Peter could have blamed John for taking Jesus to the high priest's house. John could have said, well, I'm the beloved. I stood by the cross. Jesus gave, he gave Mary to me. Thomas says, I can't believe it. Andrew says, I don't like crowds. Matthew says, where's my tax charts? All sorts of personality clashes could have taken place that day. One of the reasons why I believe that Holy Spirit is God, Holy Spirit is Jesus, this wasn't man's idea, this was God's idea, is because man would have messed it up. We would have messed it up. These guys did not know how to throw a birthday party. They did everything wrong and the Holy Spirit still showed up. And I say, thank the Lord. Thank God. Uh, okay, so let's take a little further. 100, uh, 120 people in, in one room for 240 hours, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for something they didn't know that they were waiting for. Yeah? You know, I hate waiting. I hate waiting for things that I do understand, and, and I, I don't like to wait, period. And so here they are waiting for this promise. Do you know what the promise is? No, I don't know what the promise is, but we're just waiting for the promise. 120 people in one room. That just sounds like a fight. That just sounds like someone's going to get hurt. 120 people for 240 hours? And you're waiting for something? You don't know what you're waiting for? I mean, that just is a recipe for disaster. Again, that's why I believe this has to be God. This has to be Holy Spirit. It has to be. And then on top of all that, you got Peter's preaching message, his pre-Pentecostal message in verses 15, 16, 17, and 18. You, you know the one where he talks about Judas and how Jesus took his own life and that his intestines rolled out all over the field. I mean, nobody wants to hear that message. I've preached a lot of revival messages. I've never used that text on a Sunday morning just before we go to for chicken about a Judas's guts lying all over the field. This is this is Peter's idea of a pre-Pentecostal message. It's not the good, it's a it's not a recipe for revival. The blood, the guts, the intestines. And then on top of all that, they had a business meeting. I mean, these guys really knew how to throw a great party. They have a business meeting in verses 23, 24, 25, 26. I mean, these, these guys are not doing well. They're doing it all wrong. Like, I've chaired a lot of business meetings over 24 years of pastoring and, and now 16 years as the executive director of Reapers and, and a member at large and a presbyter. I, and listen, I've never seen revival break out in any of them. I've seen a couple of fist fights in the parking lot. 
I, I've seen guys lose their sanctification and start yelling and screaming. I was at one church where I was, I was the member at large, and they had to bring the police in and, and, and deal with some of the folks. I mean, it was crazy. I've seen some of that stuff over my 63 years. But you know what? Here they are. You know, They need a new disciple, and so we're going to draw the straw program and get on with it. These guys don't have a clue what they're doing. These are some of the reasons why I believe that the church and Pentecost have to be a supernatural work of God. We would have messed it up. Man would have messed it up. Church, listen to me. Despite their personal feelings, despite who got the vote and didn't get the vote, despite their hurts and their past hurts and their failures, despite all that stuff, they were committed to one common purpose, and that was their being there to wait for the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And we need to get back to that one purpose. We need to get back to that one purpose and put aside who said what and she said and the hurts and the past. We're like We've been around long enough to build up some resentments and some hurts. We need to let all that go and get back to what Holy Spirit wants to do and how he wants to flow through us in these last days. And I say, Father, let it be so in my life. You know, there's still hope for us. I'm encouraged by reading this partial list that there's still hope for us with all our hang-ups and all our idiosyncrasies and all the stuff that we've been through and think we've been through and there's still hope for us, hallelujah. Immediately following his resurrection, Jesus began to speak of another power. Another power, there's a portion in John chapter 20 where he walked into the room where they were hiding in verses 19 and 20 and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Christ's first emphasis following his resurrection was not another program. It was not another project. It was the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need that person and presence of the Holy Spirit. I've been asked if the Spirit was not given until Pentecost, what did the disciples receive in John chapter 20 in verse 22? Well, I believe they received a little taste, but they got the whole mouthful there on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. I thank God. He just breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some proofs to what I just said, that it wasn't the whole deal and that it had to happen on Pentecost Day. In John 7, 39, the Spirit could not be poured out until Jesus was glorified. In John chapter 16, verse 7, the comfortable will not come until I go away. The comfortable will not come till I go away. In Acts 1, 4, wait for the promise of the Father. In other words, there was still something yet to come in Acts 1-5. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Wow. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2-1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, God had something very special for them after that 240 hours in that upper room. From the moment of his resurrection to the moment of his ascension, Jesus spoke of the person of the Holy Spirit. This promise of the Father became a driving force in the disciples' lives. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. You remember the days before this. You remember the days of hiding and running and locked doors and, and panic and pandemonium and, and drifting away and trying to not to be seen. And now they return to Jerusalem with great joy. With great joy. I like that. They all joined together in prayer. No one was concerned about who sat where and who said what. It was time to stand together and pray together as a unified force. Let me echo it again today, this morning, church. This is our time for the church to rise up and be a unified force. The whole world is looking to the church, looking to the church. Leaders are looking to the church. Governments looking to the church. They may not say it. We have the answer. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's empowered us in the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be, not to do ministry, not to do church, but to be what God wants you to be. That's why you're called a human being and not a human doing. Hallelujah. God has something real special for you in the days to come. Shake off your fear, church. Shake off your fear and rise up in faith and let's see what God is about to do. Let me say it again. Prepare now for what God's going to do later. Get ready, get ready, get ready. And I say, thank God. The promise of the Father just pushed them. They became that drive, it became the driving force in their life. And I say, thank God. They were together in prayer. They were unified. The King James Version uses it. They were in one accord. 
In fact, that phrase is found six times in the book of Acts. Six times. No other book carries that phrase as much as the book of Acts. They were found together in one accord. They were as one mind, one purpose, and they were in unity. And we need that today. We need that today. Church, you can be in one place, but not of one mind. Come on. We've been around for a few years. I've grown up in church. You can be in one building, have membership. You can have a membership of 500. That doesn't mean they're all in one accord. That doesn't mean they're all of one mind just because we're hanging out geographically. We need to come together spiritually, spiritually, and see the hand of God move and let go of anything else. Let go of it, let go. If it doesn't have eternal importance, it ought not to be part of our future. Uh, it's temporary at best, some of the stuff that's carried on today. And we need to rise up and be what God wants us to be in these the last days. Before we move into Acts chapter 2 verse 1, I want to ask you this question. Do you believe in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ? It's not a hard question. Do you believe in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ? How you answer this, how you answer this question will determine how you view, what you, how you view and what you do with the book of Acts. I'm serious. I want you to grab a hold of this today. There are so many who believe in the death of Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, but when it comes to Acts 2 by 4, it's like, wait, wait a minute, Chuck. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, we believe in his death. We believe in his resurrection. We believe in his ascension. And I just want you to come with me. I, 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 is it three out of three or four out of four? Let me develop this just for a moment, please. Let me develop. It's a package deal. If Christ did not die for us, we have no forgiveness of sin. If Christ did not die for us, we have no forgiveness of sin. The debt is still out there. It has not been paid. If Christ did not rise from the dead, we have no justification. We have no justification. Uh, just as we've never sinned. A nice man died for us, but because he rose again. Come on, church. The tomb was just a weekend rental. He didn't plan on staying, and I say thank the Lord for that. If he did not ascend to his father, Holy Spirit could not come. Could not come because he says, I've got to go away. In fact, he uses the word good. It's good that I go away because I, I trust the one that's coming. Uh, he, he's got my back. He, 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 we got no problem with that. And so it's good that I go away. And so the ascension is part of our doctrine. It's what we believe in. Now, if Holy Spirit did not come, we have no promise. So Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ ascended. And that allowed Holy Spirit to come. That allowed Holy Spirit to come, the promise of the Father. And I say, thank God. If Holy Spirit didn't come, we have no promise. We have no power. We have no power. Just rest on your charisma, your bucks, your beauty, and, and your charm, because that's all you got. That's all you got. But we have a power in the person of the Holy Spirit. I know that for a fact. We have no comforter. We have no convictor. Let me take it one step further. We have no church. We're just going through religious gymnastics. We can get up and down and sing and quote, raise a hand, do, do a little dance and, and head home. We can do all that stuff. We can go through all the religious gymnastics. If Holy Spirit didn't come, we have no church. We, we have no church. I don't mean just a place to go. We are the church. We are the church. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be a, a New Testament church in these last days. For the day of Pentecost was the beginning of the New Testament church. Get a hold of that. And so, so many times, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ died. Me too. I believe he rose to the dead. Yeah, me too. I believe he ascended. Me too. All that, all that so he could pay the price for us. I get that. But also all that so the Holy Spirit could come and, and, and initiate, begin this process in our hearts and our lives that have brought us to where we are today. The second chapter of Acts describes the experience of the disciples at Pentecost. Come with me. In verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. King James puts it that way. NIV says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. I, again, I'll say, how many know you can be in one place but not in one accord? I, we understand that. And then there was a suddenly. Come on, you've heard this preached before. There was a suddenly. They, they expected the unexpected, and it happened. The promise of the Father began to take shape. And we, listen, church, we need some suddenly. Listen, I've grown up in the church. You didn't miss church because you, you didn't know what Holy Ghost was going to do. 
Uh, you didn't set your clock by while pastor's doing offering right now. You, did, you didn't miss church because you didn't want to miss out. My father used to put it, under, put it this way. I didn't get it when I was a kid, but I get it now. You need to be under the spout where the glory comes out. Hallelujah. And we need that place. We need that place to worship that suddenly of the Holy Spirit. Listen, a suddenly. We need a suddenly. We need, we desperately need the suddenly of the Holy Spirit. I want you to note three things that happened that day. First of all, there was a sound. There was a sound, verse two, there was a sound, a sound from heaven like a wind that filled the house. It was a like wind. It was not a feeling, but it was a sound. Right? It wasn't necessarily felt, it was heard. There was a sound, they weren't, they, you need to get that in your heart. There was a sound like a wind that filled the house, like wind. They weren't hanging onto the furniture going, whoa, 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 help me Rhonda. They weren't doing that. That's not what I'm talking about. The word of God says there was a sound. It was a divine sound in its origin. It came from heaven. It was strong, it was violent, it was rushing. It's like trying to hold a conversation at Niagara Falls. See, Holy Spirit wants to interrupt human conversation. We talk about him as inspired speech, but he's more than that. He's more than that. Holy Spirit will give you the words to say if you'll but open your mouth. He'll inspire your speech, but he's more than that. He's much more than that. And I hope that comes to light in our time together. He filled the whole house. It was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The wind filled the house. The word spirit is the same as wind in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek, Genesis 2. And God formed man and breathed onto him the breath of life. Same thing in Acts chapter 2. Same thing. And God formed the church and breathed into the body the breath of life. What gives the church life? It's the Holy Spirit. Let me make it very clear for you, because I'm a bottom line guy. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot have church. Thank you. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot have church. You, you can professionalize it, you can package it, it can be good, it can be all that in a bag of chips, but you're not having church. You're not having church without Holy Spirit. You are not, it's not going to happen. Read the word of God. It's in there, it's true. We need to hear from heaven, not just feel heaven. Everybody wants a little touch, me too. I like it when God touches me. But we need to hear from heaven. We've heard from everybody else. We've heard from everybody else, everybody out there writing a book during COVID, right? God bless them. We need to hear from God. We need to hear from God. And I say, Father, help us. We need the strong breath of God to fill the house, fill, the, fill our bodies with the breath of God. Otherwise, we're dead. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. I got to tell you, if you're a part of a dead church, you don't have a bright future. I thank God that this house is not dead, that this house is alive. This house, man, if you were in this place today, you would sense the presence of God in worship and word and witness. And I say, thank God. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to touch you where you're at today. So there was this sound. Secondly, there was a sight. Verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each one of them. All right? I like that. Twice John the Baptist states, he will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Fire. Come on, some of you need a little fire. Some of you, in fact, we all need a little fire. Never mind some. We all need a little fire. We all need some fire. Some of you need a whole lot of fire. Holy Ghost and fire. Listen, if you got baptized in the Holy Ghost and, and get some fire, go back and get some. Go back and get some. Holy Ghost is still alive and moving and still on the throne. Hallelujah. So they seem to see these tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest upon each one of them. Like fire. Their heads weren't on fire. Right? It wasn't like the ooh, ooh, they're, they're smack on the top of their head going, ooh, my, uh, hot heads for Jesus. No. It signifies cleansing, purifying, sanctifying power. A fire that ignited and illuminated. It separated and sat on each one of them. Again, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Symbol of the Holy Spirit. Symbol of the Holy Spirit. There was this sound. There was this sight. This sight. I, I love the manifestations of God. But we need more than the manifestations of God. We have people today that are in love with the manifestations, but they don't know Jesus. I'm serious. They, they, they've got people that, that love worship. They love the beat. They love the music. But they don't know Jesus. That was prophesied before I was born. In the last days, people would sing about a God they didn't know. I mean, that's been talked about for decades, and so we're in that place today. So let's make sure it's not a manifestation craze, it's a Jesus craze. Hallelujah. Manifestations won't change you, the Holy Spirit will. We need more than conviction, we need change. 
You can build up an immunity to the Holy Spirit with enough little injections. It's like building up antibodies in your system so your system now fights it and protects you. The same thing with Holy Spirit, but it's not a positive, it's a negative where you get enough of the Holy Spirit to feel bad, but not enough to walk good. Come on, church. You know it's true. We've been around for a little while. Third thing, they spoke. Verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Not 90%, 95%. Holy Spirit didn't come down and look around the room and go, mm, these are cloven tongues, by the way. Come down and go, mm, yeah, Peter, nah, we got some work to do. And, you know, tax collector. Nah. He didn't do that, Andrew. Nah. He didn't do that. There was 120 in the upper room and 120 were baptized in the Holy Ghost. You are not the one that can't be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You are not the one. Shake that off. Shake that off. That's not of God. Right? I, I, the Holy Spirit came down. The wind, the fire, it, it, embols, it, it signifies Holy Spirit. Tongues were the first result of the coming of the Spirit. Yeah. I look at We talk about it as the initial evidence. It's a good start, but it's not the finish. It's a gateway to where God wants to take you. They were all filled. No exemption. Everyone in the, word, in the room heard the wind. Tongues like fire rested each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is no respecter of person? Aren't you glad? You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have, you don't have to do that. You don't have to, well, I'm not good enough. Listen, not, it's not about you being good enough. It's about the work of Jesus Christ in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants to bless you. God wants to flow through you. God wants to empower you. It's not about him saying, oh, you're not good enough. Maybe in a couple of years from now. I, I, no, no, I don't want to play that game. Listen, church, let me keep messing with you. As Pentecostals, we have not been satisfied with Holy Spirit just filling the house. Let me say it again. My charismatic brothers and sisters, they, they love that. And even it, when I pastored, I'd shake hands at the door and say, oh, pastor, wasn't that a great service? Wasn't that a great service? And after a while, I'd stop them at the door and go, what does that mean to you? Like, I want to know what's a great service. Because in my mind, I, I wasn't sure. You know, that, that's just me, right? So I want to know what was a great service. Is it because, you know, the, the band sang your favorite song? Was it because the air conditioning was at 69? Was it because we, we, got, we, got pew, we got chairs down instead of pews and, and we beat another denomination of the Swiss Chalet for lunch? Like what, 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 was, what was, I want to know. Have we made it so normal and natural that we've just totally removed the Holy Spirit from the whole atmosphere? I love Holy Spirit atmosphere, but as Pentecostals, we're not happy with them just filling the house and the, the room, the church, the building. We want them to come and fill the house. This is the house. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Six foot four of Irish Wells Temple. Glory to God. Come on, church. Open up this morning. Allow Holy Spirit to disinvest in your heart and your life in a greater measure. And I say thank God. So I don't want just a little conviction. I don't want just a little comfort. I want change. I want change. Some of you have been convicted for so long. I've already touched on this. You've built up an immunity to it. Holy Spirit comes now. You don't even pay attention anymore. Uh, you're not soft anymore to the things that God used to speak to you about. Things you used to weep after a Sunday morning service. You're, you're too busy going on about your heart and your life or trying to run church business. I say, Father, would you help us to get serious with what God is about to do? We need to get passionate about the Holy Spirit. Fill the house, yes, but fill the temple, yes. Change me. Supernatural empowered from the inside out. Inside out. Inside out. Inside out. It's not about external warmth and fuzzy, you know, and it's, uh, I just want to feel God. Uh, me too, but church, there's got to be more than that. That won't change who you are. It's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is so powerful. Come on. These guys walked with Jesus for what? How many months? How many years? Peter was still a liar. Am I making this up? It's in the book. Peter's still a stinking liar. Right? He can't even tell, tell a little 12-year-old that he knew Jesus Christ. And the rest of them are hiding behind walls like a bunch of little school children. Right? All of a sudden, what happens? They spend 240 hours in the upper room. They had the best Bible teacher in the universe, Jesus. They had, the, they had the professor of all professors. They saw signs and wonders. They saw miracles. They saw what he did, his life. They saw him in private. They saw him in public. They, they got a touch of his prayer life. And still, they were messed up. They spent 120 of them in the upper room for 10 days. And they walked out of there. Peter was changed. Peter was changed. He was no man be pamby little 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 nothing who preached about blood and guts in some field and intestines. He stood up there on that day on Pentecost and he began to share like he never shared before. That's inspired speech. 
That's inspired speech where the Holy Spirit comes and takes your tongue and uses it. But it happened because they had an experience in the upper room. There's always a private ministry before there's a public ministry. Always. Always. You want public ministry? Then you need to spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ privately and just spend some time in his presence. I thank God. He enabled. He didn't force them. He borrows your mouth, your vocal cords. Your mind is unfruitful at this point. It's not your mind sending messages to your mouth. It's your spirit speaking. It's your spirit speaking. God takes my mouth that has cussed and swore and used his name in vain and told lies and dirty stories and put things in it it shouldn't have. And he takes this mouth and he uses it now to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've got this prayer language now, hallelujah, that nobody taught me. Holy Spirit just came in when I was five. I got away from God in my teenage years. The night I rededicated my life to Jesus Christ, that prayer language flowed for me for hours. Hours, hours. He never left me. He made a promise to me. He'd always be with me. And he did. Hallelujah. Church, I got to tell you, what happened in that upper room that day was the real deal. And these guys' lives were changed. And so can your life be changed. Now, I know there are those who say, well, speaking in tongues is not for today. It was just a kickstart for the early church. It was a one-time experience in Acts chapter 2. They kind of needed a little something, something to get going. It's just for preachers. It's just for the apostles, the prophets, the leaders, the the 120 in that day. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh, I don't believe that. Peter was the only preacher on the day of Pentecost. Peter was the only preacher on the day of Pentecost, but Holy Spirit moved on 120 guys and gals in that upper room, and I say, thank God. Some say, I got it all when I got saved. I just got the whole package deal when I got saved. Yes, the triune lives within you upon salvation. But there's a subsequent work of the Holy Spirit called spirit baptism. I believe the day you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in. I believe in the triune. I believe Jesus came in. It's a package deal to me. Some of you ought to thank God for the package deal. You kept all three of them busy for a lot of years before you came to your senses and called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Others say it's not of God. It's of the devil. I, I never got that one. I never understood that one. That means there, be, there ought to be bank robbers and drug addicts speaking in tongues. You still with me? All right. that, that means that the world ought to be speaking in tongues and the church ought to be quiet. If it's of the devil, it's of the devil. That, that, that's never made sense to me. It, or, or it's not for today. I don't buy that what, uh, whatsoever, whatsoever. It's not of God, it's of the devil. Acts chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Remember when Peter was up there, the people began to say, what does this mean? What does this mean? What's going on? Peter stands up and delivers his first message post-Pentecost. I love this opening line. I love it. I wish I could walk into a sanctuary on a Sunday morning at 1030 and open up with this line. We are not drunk as you suppose. We're not three sheets to the wind. We're not hammered. Not yet. Glory to God. Right? These men are not drunk as you suppose. Wouldn't that be awesome to walk into the house on a Sunday morning and people are plastered in the Holy Ghost? Come on, some of you need a good drunk. Some of you need a good drunk of the Holy Ghost. Some of you need a good drunk. You've been beaten up, but you've been watching too much CP24. I gotta tell you, release all that stuff. Never mind CP24. I got a Jesus 24, hallelujah, and a Holy Spirit 24 that's leading us and guiding us and will open your eyes with a greater understanding about what he's doing than to listen to all the junk that's out there today. Man alive. They just spoke it, stepped up, stepped up. I love that line. This is what was spoken of the prophet Joel. This is the prophet, this is what they talked about, prophesied about. Not for today, you say, of the devil, you say. Acts 2, 37 to 39, when Peter finished, the crowd cried out, what shall we do? That's when you know it's Holy Spirit. That's when you know it's Holy Spirit. When you begin your message and they go, what does this mean? But you finish your message, they go, what should we do? Somewhere in those lines was the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that began to nudge their hearts until they reached a place where, what do we do? What do we do? This is all new to us. We don't get it. We don't, the world had come to Jerusalem. What a great opportunity. Hallelujah. It's like the world that has come to Canada. And we, the Canadian church, need to rise up and just, st- just say, God, I want what you have for these last days. The last days. God wants to pour his spirit out. God wants to pour his spirit out. There's no shortage of God. There's no shortage of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What promise, people say? What promise? What promise? Well, I'll tell you. Acts 1, 4, 5. The gift of my, that my father promised. You know, Acts 2, 4. Pentecost. Hallelujah. Acts 2 by 4. I still got one axe to grind. Hallelujah. And that's Acts 2 by 4. Church, it didn't stop there. In Acts 8, 14 to 19. Remember Simon the sorcerer? He wanted to buy in. 
This is eight years after Pentecost. He wanted to buy in. He wanted to buy it. He saw something. He wanted to buy it. I, I need some of that. I want to buy some of that. This is eight years. So don't tell me it was a one-shot deal. Don't tell me it was just on the day of Pentecost. Don't tell me that. You know, it's Saul's conversion, Acts chapter 9. I mean, he got the whole package deal. He got healed, saved, set free, baptized in the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 9, verse 17. He, he got the whole package. The whole package. And I say, thank God. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. In Cornelius' house, as Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit moved on the Gentiles. That's 10 years from Acts 2 by 4. So don't tell me it was just for that moment, moment. Don't tell me it was just for the 120. A decade's gone by. In fact, I love it. Holy Spirit didn't even wait for Peter to say amen. He, Holy Spirit didn't wait for Peter to enter his third conclusion. And finally, Holy Spirit just stepped up and went, bam, I'll take it from here. We need that. We need that today. And I say, thank God. Peter recounts the story to those in Jerusalem in Acts 11, 15 to 17. And his conclusion... Here's his conclusion. Who was I to think that I could oppose God? He realized now that God was moving not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And we need to see the same thing. And I say, thank God. I grew up in my teenage years in downtown Toronto through the charismatic movement. My father pastored a church down there near Young and Dundas. Sunday morning was 22 to 1800. Sunday night was 2200. Wednesday night Bible study was 1500. Our Catholic brothers came in by the thousands over that period of time. Over six, seven months, we had church every night but Saturday. And they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I wasn't necessarily serving the Lord back then, but I witnessed with my eyes this power, this presence, this person of the Holy Spirit. And I say, thank God. Let me see it again. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, Paul at Ephesus, 20 years later, 20 years later, 20 years later, and on and on we go. On and on we go. Does every reference state that when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues? No. It would be like saying they were water baptized and they got wet. I figure they got wet if they got water baptized. When you got saved, you got Jesus. You got Jesus. I believe that speaking in tongues is the initial sign of Holy Spirit doing a work in your life. It's a beginning. It's not an end. It's a gateway. One of the tragedies in the, today's Pentecostal circles is that we've made it the initial and not the fullness. Not the fullness. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm all for speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues every day of my life. But I've got to tell you, church, to be quite honest, some of the meanest people in our church are speaking in tongues. I'm telling you straight up. Right? The, the, some of the meanest people. So there's got to be more. It's the initial. It opens a door. Again, it's a gateway. But that needs to grow. Holy Spirit needs to grow in your life with the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. You say, well, Chuck, I, I, you know, I tried to speak in tongues and it didn't seem to work for me. That's your problem. You tried. It's not you. It's not you. A couple of thoughts. Any time you spend in the presence of God, it should be a good time. You don't go into the presence of God to get. You go into the presence of God to give. Oh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And I, I was at a men's retreat and I prayed and I was at a camp meeting and I prayed and I was in my bedroom and I prayed. Did I mention they were in the upper room for 240 hours? So I appreciate your six hours in the last decade. I appreciate that. I appreciate your seven hours in the last 12 years. They were 240 hours in that upper room, not twisting the arm of God, not twisting the arm of Holy Spirit, but preparing their lives, getting ready for a sovereign move that would usher in the New Testament church. Let me close it out with this. I believe with all my heart that speaking in tongues is for today. I do. I do. I do. It's one of the reasons why it's so controversial. If it wasn't, I just believe speaking in tongues is for today. We have no monopoly on Holy Spirit because we call ourselves Pentecostal. Holy Spirit will go where people are hungry. If you're not hungry, he'll go somewhere else. I believe the day that you were saved, Holy Spirit came in. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that every kingdom has a language. I believe that the tongues already resides inside of you. Already resides inside of you. It just needs to bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up. Word of God says in your belly in my big old Irish belly there flows a river there flows a river that's looking for an opening and I offer one of the biggest openings that I can have right here my big old mouth and say Holy Spirit would you take my vocal cords that used to say some stuff that 
wouldn't please anyone, especially Jesus or my mama. Would you take my vocal cords and use me to make a difference in this generation, privately and publicly, through the presence, the power, the instruction of the Holy Spirit, through this baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes, inspired speech, but my private time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit's the great equalizer. I wouldn't have picked these disciples to be the CEOs of my companies. I wouldn't have picked them to be managers. They would fight over who sat beside Jesus. It's like one chair on the right-hand side and 11 bottoms trying to head for the one seat. I, I, would, I wouldn't want them to run a vending machine, but Jesus Christ picked them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes the great equal, the great equal. You say, well, Chuck, I, I, I didn't get through school. I hear you. Had to help mom and dad in the farm. I get it. Some of you have more degrees than a thermometer. Get all the edu edu education you can get. But I'm talking about Holy Spirit that's greater than your education, your intellect, and your street smarts. The Holy Spirit will take your life and just be an equalizer to the situations you're facing. I believe that the only prere prerequisite for Holy Spirit baptism is salvation. Uh huh. I believe the promise of the Father is still in place today. I believe that with my whole heart, I wouldn't preach it. I wouldn't preach it. You're worth more. You're worth more. But I believe, I believe the promise of the Father is still in place today. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to baptize you right there in your home, right where where you are, right there. If he can do it in the upper room with all the commotion, all the fuss, and all the thing, things I just described pre-Pentecost, my goodness, then Holy Spirit who already lives inside of you, already resides in the uttermost parts of your body, if you just allow him to bubble up and bubble up and praise and worship him, whether it be English or French or whatever is your, your mother tongue, and just begin to worship and praise. Sometimes it's easier to receive just by singing. Some of you, that's your, you just, your worshipers, you sing, and all of a sudden this beautiful, beautiful heavenly language just begins to roll out in your song. It's not a bad thing, church. It's not a bad thing. It's good today to receive on this Pentecost Sunday. Could we just take a few moments and worship him? Could we just, right where you are, we just worship your hand, raise your hands, begin to worship him. Say, Father, here I am, flow through me flow through me for my innermost being runs a river of living water say chuck i've done that i've been there i'm asking you to do it again i'm asking you just to open yourself up say holy spirit here i am here i am from my belly flows a river of living water. Let that river flow today in Jesus' name. Let that river flow today in Jesus' name. Father, we get out of the way. It's not our mind, it's our spirit. It's our spirit that speaks. It's our spirit. It's not your brain. It's not your brain. It's your spirit. It's your spirit. She would you just continue to worship him and give him praise? Worship team is going to take us into one more song. I just pray blessing over your lives today. I just know, right in your home, right in your home, right in your home, God can baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire, and fire, 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 fire to burn away all the junk that has no eternal value in your future. In Jesus' name, I pray it over your life. I speak it. I believe it. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, receive today. Receive today. Receive today what God has for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shame. 
tasted and seen the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame Holy Spirit, you are welcome here.